So today we're going to be doing the current affairs for 11th of February 2022. The first topic for the day would be Haryana cabinet not for anti-conversion bill. So one of the topics which is very controversial and is often in the news is about religious conversion. Now, before we start talking about religious conversion, since it's a very uh, sensitive topic, we have to understand the background of religious conversions. What are the rights that we as citizens have with respect to religion? So, please go through the fundamental rights from Article 25 till Article 30, which talk about your right to freedom. So, the Haryana cabinet So, the Haryana cabinet on Tuesday approved the draft of the Haryana Prevention of Unlawful Conversion of Religion Bill 2022 which seeks to prohibit religious conversions. Okay. So, the thing is that over here it has been said that the Haryana cabinet has approved the draft of the bill. Now, once the cabinet approves the draft of the bill, the bill is okayed and it is then afterwards it is introduced by the government in the legislative assembly. And once the legislative assembly passes it, if the state also has a legislative council. A legislative council then the bill goes there and after it gets passed over there, it goes to the governor for approval. Now, there are some states which have legislative council. Please do read which are the states which have a legislative council and which are the states which need approval of the legislative council as well. If the state has a legislative council, then the bill goes from the legislative assembly to the legislative council. Otherwise, the bill directly goes from the legislative assembly to the governor who has four options. He can either approve the bill, he can withhold assent to the bill, he can send back the bill. Remember, withhold assent. Send back the bill, but he can do it only once. Or he can reserve the bill for the presidential approval under Article 200. Now, when we step into the news, we understand that states such as UP, Gujarat, MP and several other states have already brought strong laws against forced conversions. Remember, they have brought laws against forced conversions. We need to understand currently what is the scenario. The bill itself, it seeks to prohibit religious conversions made through Mispresentations, misrepresentations, force, undue influence, coercion, allurement, or by fraudulent means, or by marriage, or for marriage. Under the bill, the burden of proof lies on the accused. In a lot of cases, the burden of proof often lies on the investigating team or the prosecuting team. But however, in this particular, under this particular bill, the proof of burden that that particular person did not someone, did not force someone or did not misrepresent the facts or did not cheat someone to convert them has to be proven by the person itself, by the accused itself. Okay. Now. It prescribes higher punishments in the case of conversion of minor women 
and members of the scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. Now, why do we have higher punishments for the conversion of all these people? That is because these classes are the more vulnerable classes and hence it is easier to convert them. That is the reason why the bill introduces more uh, penal provisions in order to curb the conversion of these people. Every individual converting from one religion to another will have to submit a declaration that it was not being done through misrepresentation, use of force, under threat or undue influence. However, now we see the challenges. This is fine. However, how do we prove or how is it that every time some person converts, why is it that he has to prove that it was not due to force or it was not due to misrepresentation of the facts? It becomes a burden on the person who is trying to convert. That is a problem. Now, the other challenges are that recently the Gujarat High Court when examining the issue of the Gujarat Forced Anti-Conversion Bill, it stated some of the provisions of the Gujarat Anti-Conversion Bill uh, in August 2021. Example, provisions like the one that places the burden of proof on those entering into an interfaith marriage. This particular bill had a clause which said that Whenever people are entering into an interfaith marriage, which means that marriage between different religions, then it depends upon them to prove that it was not a forced marriage or it was not a marriage of coercion. Now, that becomes a very big burden on all those people who are going for interfaith marriages, on all those people who are going for uh, religious conversion. It becomes a burden because every time they have to prove that it was not through coercion. It was out of the natural will. Now, Article 21 of the Constitution guarantees individuals the right to marry a person of one's choice. We know that. Right to life and personal liberty. And Article 25 of the Indian Constitution says that we have the freedom of conscience and, and we have the right to free profession, practice and propagation of religion. However, this particular article uh, says that no person shall be forced or no person shall force their particular religion onto others and no person should be forced to practice any religion against their own wishes. So, though that particular article allows for practicing, professing and propagating religion, it does not allow any person to force their particular religion onto anyone else. That is, a, that is the difference. The article provides the right to practice any particular religion, but it, not, it does not allow you to force your religion onto someone else. Mm. And the other problem being that in the existing bill, there are certain very vague words which are very wide in nature, which gives a lot of scope for, uh, you know, for uh, torture or for uh, uh, unnecessarily uh, filing a case against them or putting them in trouble. There is vague terminology like misrepresentation of facts, force, fraud, allurement. Now, this can be misused in such a wide manner. Any person who does not like you or any person who does not uh, uh, want to see you happy, they can foister, you know, false cases onto you because the words that are being used in the bill are of very vague nature. Now, the Supreme Court has already given certain verdicts regarding religious conversions. In the Hadia case, which happened in the year 2017 in Kerala, the Supreme Court held that under Article 21, the state, uh, the Supreme Court held that the state and the courts have no jurisdiction over an adult's absolute right to choose a life partner. This is guaranteed under Article 21. So, the court had actually said, the Supreme Court, which is the supreme interpreter of the constitution, held that 
when it comes to choosing an adult's uh, life partner it is his or her own absolute right and the state does not have any role to play the supreme court has said that you can choose any person you want to marry irrespective of the religion so this particular bill you know do you see that it is in a way contradictory to the supreme court's uh, stand and in the sarla mutkal case however the supreme court held that religious conversions carried without a bona fide belief and for the sole purpose of deriving some legal benefit do not hold any ground like say for example just converting to any particular religion in order to have multiple uh, in order to practice polygamy will not be recognized according to supreme court why it says that religious conversions carried out carried out without a bona fide belief you need i mean when a person is not believing in a religion but yet wants to convert to that particular religion only for the sake of practicing polygamy i am giving this as an example then it does not hold any ground according to the supreme court under sarla mutkal case okay now what can the government actually do the government can under article 18 of the universal declaration of human rights we have the universal declaration of human rights okay this was in the 1940s along with this universal declaration of human rights india is a signatory to the india is a signatory to the udhr universal declaration of human rights along with this uh, we also have the international covenant on civil and political rights international uh, covenant on social and economic rights so all these three put together the universal declaration of human rights international covenant on civil and political rights international covenant on social and economic rights all these three put together are known as the international bill of rights so under article 18 of the universal declaration of human rights it mentions that every person has the right to freedom of religion including changing their faith and center can frame a model law like the model law on contract farming the center can instead of leaving it to the states to make vague laws rather it can frame a model law from which the states can get influence and form better laws when it comes to religious conversions also people also need to be educated about the provisions and ways of forceful conversions inducement or allurement etc okay next article citizenship amendment act okay there is a petition in the delhi high court seeking direction to the national investigation agency to find out anti national forces behind the protests against the citizenship amendment act now there is a petition in the delhi high court asking the delhi high court to force the nia to understand or the nia to investigate the uh, reasons behind the protests uh, that happened against the citizenship amendment act now first of all we need to know what the citizenship amendment act is what are the provisions of this act why were there protests against this particular act the objective of the citizenship amendment act is to grant indian citizenship to persecuted minorities noted down only persecuted minorities namely hindus sikhs jains buddhists parsis and christians from not all the countries only from three countries 
namely Pakistan, Bangladesh and Afghanistan. So only persecuted minorities one. Only these particular religions which are mentioned over here two. Only these particular countries which are mentioned three. Okay. Now those from these communities who had come to India till December 31st, 2014 facing religious persecution in their respective countries will not be treated as illegal immigrants. So, when you are a persecuted minority coming in from these three countries, you will not be treated as an illegal immigrant as long as you are coming before December 31st, 2014. Otherwise, people were considered as illegal immigrants and they were prosecuted under two acts known as the Foreigners Act and the Passport Act. So, now all those people will not be targeted as illegal immigrants. Rather, they would be seen as persecuted minorities. The act provides that the central government may cancel the registration of OCIs on certain grounds. Who are the OCIs? Do we have a person of uh, Indian origin card still? Please go through this. I will give a brief uh, description. Overseas citizen of India, OCI, is a person who is related to India. He is not a citizen of India. He is not an NRI. He is a person who is closely related to India through either by being a descendant and he has certain benefits such as visiting India any number of times. He does not need a visa. He does not come. Uh, he does not need to report to the police every time he visits India and certain other benefits. So, the act provides that the central government may cancel the registration of OCIs on certain grounds. Again, a little vague, but let's move on. Okay. This particular act, however, does not apply to the tribal areas of Tripura, Mizoram, Assam and Meghalaya because of being included in the 6th schedule of the constitution. Please read what uh, the 6th schedule is and what is the difference between tribal areas and scheduled areas. Tribal areas and scheduled areas. Tribal areas under schedule 6 and and uh, scheduled areas under Schedule 5. Please read the difference between these two. Uh, you can find it in your Lakshmi Khan. Now, the act does not apply to the tribal areas. Areas that fall under the inner line limit notified under the Bengal Eastern Frontier Regulation Act of 1873 will be outside the act. Now, please know what are the states which come under inner line permit zone. How many states are there? Now, these states which need an inner line permit will not allow our other citizens of India to come to those states without the inner line permit. The amendment relaxes the requirement of nationalization from 11 years to 5 years for applicants belonging to these 6 religions. These religions. Okay. So, Please do re read about nationalization of citizens. What are the different ways of acquiring citizenship? It can be by birth, by descent, by naturalization, by registration and by occupation of territory. There are five ways in which one person can get the citizenship of India. What are these five ways? Birth. Descent, nationalization, registration and occupation of territory. So, under that particular nationalization method, the number of years has been reduced from 11 years to 5 years for these particular people who are persecuted minorities. Now, however, what are the problems with the act? There exist several problems with the act. 
there are apprehensions that the citizenship amendment act followed by a country wide comp compilation of the national register of citizens the nrc will benefit non muslims excluded from the proposed citizens register do you see that the only religion that has been excluded only major religion that has been excluded is islam hence there is a belief that when they conduct the nrc people of this particular religion will be adversely affected and it will be very difficult for them to prove their citizenship why they will be treated as illegal immigrants then instead of persecuted minorities and they will find it very difficult to retain their citizenship it also contradicts the assam accord of 1985 actually in assam one of the reasons for extreme insurgency during the 80s was because of the exodus from bangladesh there was a lot of people who were coming in from bangladesh and this particular migrant class which was coming in from bangladesh had regular conflicts with the tribals who were staying within the northeast especially in the assam hence the government of india signed an accord uh, known as the assam accord under the prime ministership of rajiv gandhi and some of the provisions of the accord were that india will not allow india will not allow any illegal immigration of uh, bangladeshi citizens anymore and all those people who were all those people who had entered into india after 1971 had to be deported 25th march 1971 would be deported only those people who were entering in between 1966 and 1971 they will be barred from voting for 10 years they will be barred from voting for 10 years and after that they would be given the voting rights and the others would be citizens either way those who came before that so however do you see this even though there are people and what does the current act say it says that people who had come in till 2014 and this act says 1971 so there is a contradiction over here which means that people who came after 1971 can also be given citizenship as long as they come in before 2014 hence it is contradicting the assam accord and that's a problem the act goes against fundamental rights why because it is violative of the article 14 of the constitution what does article 14 say it talks about the right to equality how is how is there right to equality when you are particularly saying that this particular religion is not included within the ambit of the law it is also discriminatory in nature india has several other refugees that includes tamils from sri lanka are these given are these people given citizenship no hindu uh, rohingyas from myanmar are they given no or any rohingyas none of the rohingyas are not they are not covered under the act it also goes on to hamper bilateral ties the act talks of religious oppression that has happened and is happening in these three countries it talks about three countries what are the three countries afghanistan pakistan and bangladesh so the act clearly states that there is oppression of these minorities happening in these countries and hence it affects the bilateral ties this was one of the reasons after this act and the bangladeshi foreign minister who had to visit india on a bilateral summit had cancelled out on his plan and hence you can say that this particular act directly affects the bilateral ties next there is a difficulty in administration as it will be difficult for the government to differentiate between illegal migrants illegal immigrants and those who are persecuted minorities it is very difficult for the administration to be able to differentiate between these two next okay this one is a very important topic the rbi holds rates to spur growth holds 
rates to spur growth what are these rates repo rate reverse repo rate liquidity adjustment facility marginal standing facility the rbi has continued to go with the existing monetary policy which is there and it has actually said that it would be of accommodative nature which means that either the repo rate will remain as it is or the repo rate will reduce further so one of the functions of the monetary policy committee is to decide the nature of the repo rate the repo rate decides a lot of factors it decides inflation it decides growth it denotes it decides everything so within the within the rbi's monetary policy committee there exist three different uh, outcomes that can come out of a monetary policy committee meeting one is the accommodative stance two is the neutral stance three is the calibrated tightening stance so the monetary policy committee can go to any of these uh, three particular uh, stances however the rbi's monetary policy committee on thursday kept the policy interest rates unchanged and by a 5 is to 1 majority voted to continue the accommodative stance the rbi has voted to continue with the existing accommodative stance and i told you accommodative stance means that rbi continues either with the same repo rate or it will reduce the repo rate while neutral means that the rbi is neutral it is not talking about increasing or decreasing the repo rate rather it will stay however it is currently calibrated tightening means that it will increase the interest rates decrease increase okay more on the news flagging potential downside risks from the highly contagious omicron variant the monetary policy committee noted there had been some loss of momentum in economic activity flagging the existing downside risks from the existing omicron variant now because of the omicron variant what is happening the demand for goods or services is falling and hence there is a need to ensure that the repo rate remains low only when the repo rate remains low will it be easier for people and for companies to borrow money and borrowing money will mean that there will be higher spending of money that will revive the demand and when there is demand there will be growth so that is the cycle low interest rates low interest rates easy money easy money more demand more demand more growth and that is how you come out of the cycle of low growth so because of the omicron variant the rbi has decided to keep the interest rates low in order to ensure that there is more demand and hence more consumption the monetary policy committee also noted that the consumer price inflation has edged higher since its last meeting the monetary policy committee has noticed that because of the higher money supply there is more inflation however the mpc held that the headline inflation would peak in the current quarter within the tolerance band and then it would 
moderate. This had provided room for policy to remain accommodative. Because the RBI is also saying that the inflation, even if it increases, it will still remain within the tolerance band and it will fall later on. Hence, the RBI could take the chance of keeping the uh, repo in a monetary policy committee in accommodative stance. Okay, next. Please know what the monetary policy, RBI monetary policy committee is. Now, the fiscal policy lies in the hands of the government, while the monetary policy lies in the hands of the RBI. The fiscal policy lies in the hands of the government and the monetary policy lies in the hands of the RBI. Now, the Monetary Policy Committee is a statutory and an institutionalized framework under the Reserve Bank of India Act of 1934. Remember this, it is under the Reserve Bank of India Act and it is a statutory body for maintaining price stability while keeping in mind the objective of growth. It wants to control inflation, but at the same time, it also wants to ensure that there is growth. It wants to achieve both the targets, but more importantly, inflation has to remain in control. That is the role of an MPC, Monetary Policy Committee. It was decided to be framed under the recommendations of the Urjit Patel Committee in 2014. Now, some of the provisions of the Monetary Policy Committee are that the ex officio chairperson is the governor of the RBI. Meeting uh, the meet, the quorum for the meeting is four persons, including the governor of RBI, legally required to hold minimum four meetings in a year. In practice, they meet every two months to decide bi-monthly monetary policy updates. When they vote for the first time, all the members, including the governor, will vote. However, if there exists some sort of a tie and parity between contradicting opinions, then the governor will get a casting vote to break the tie and whatever the governor says will prevail. To ensure transparency, the government can send a message only in writing to the Monetary Policy Committee so that everyone knows. And the committee must publish its minutes of the meeting on 14th day after the meeting and the monetary policy report at every 6 month intervals. After every 6 months, the Monetary Policy Committee has to publish its monetary policy report. Okay. One more important role of the Monetary Policy Committee is that the inflation target is decided by the union government after consulting with the RBI governor. Now, what is inflation? Please do know that the inflation target is set by the is set by the government after consultation with the RBI governor. Currently, the inflation target that we have in our country is 4 plus or minus 2 percent, which means that if the inflation goes beyond 6 percent or if it falls to lesser than 2 percent, then it is a problem. The monetary policy committee has to ensure that it lies between this particular limit. If it either goes beyond 6% or falls to lesser than 2%, then and this remains for 3 quarters. 3 quarters means each quarter has 3 months in it. 3 quarters means 9 months. So, if this continues for 9 months, then the RBI has to give a report in writing to the government as to the reasons why this has happened and also the solutions to the government to address this particular issue. Now, what is inflation first of all? Very important topic, please do read it. Inflation refers to the rise in the prices of most goods and services of daily or common use such as food, clothing, housing, recreation, transport, consumer staples, etc. So, inflation Nothing, it's, it just talks about the increase in prices. If rice this year is 
uh, at a uh, cost of say 20 rupees per kg and the next year the same rice is 25 rupees there is an inflation of about 25 percent right 25 percent as compared to the previous year so now wholesale price in so when it comes to inflation we have two particular indices to measure the inflation one is known as the wholesale price index and the other one is known as the consumer price index the wholesale price index it measures the inflation when it comes to wholesale goods it deals at the inflation at the end of the uh, wholesale traders who, who trade in bulk many goods while the consumer price index it deals with the idea of inflation at the consumer level at retail level you me when we go to the shop to buy we are the consumers and retail persons while people buying in bulk are known as the uh, our deal with the wholesale price index it measures the changes in the prices of goods uh, sold and traded in bulk by wholesale businesses to other businesses published by the office of economic advisor ministry of commerce and industry while the consumer price index is published by the national statistical office the cpi calculates the difference in the price of commodities and services such as food medical care education electronics etc next the nirbhaya fund nirbhaya fund why is it in the news the delhi government has requested the center to release over 11 crores from the nirbhaya fund for illumination of over a thousand dark spots in the capital in the national capital of delhi now Post the Nirbhaya case, the government had set up a dedicated fund called as the Nirbhaya Fund in 2013 with the focus of implementing the initiatives aimed at improving the security and safety of women in India. What are the provisions of this particular Nirbhaya Fund? It is a non lapsable corpus. What does non lapsable mean? Lapsable means that after every financial year, the funds allocated for that particular ministry or for that particular fund will lapse which means that it will go to zero and all the funds that you have given till that particular which remain in that particular account will become zero it will be gone however non lapsable means that the funds will not be gone and they will remain if at all there is any unused fund with uh, uh, unused money within that particular fund it will remain until the next year as well and the next year you can add more funds to that unused fund non lapsable corpus fund for safety and security of women the department of economic affairs under the ministry of finance is responsible for the administration of the fund while the women and child development ministry is the nodal agency for the expenditure from the nirbhaya fund so it is the women and child development ministry that examines the programs submitted to it by the various states different states will have different programs for women safety so they will submit these programs to the ministry of women and child development and it will review these particular programs under the nirbhaya scheme and approves them it recommends to the department of economic affairs for allocating the funds and it is up to the, the department of economic affairs to allocate any funds and for uh, ensuring that sufficient money is given for executing that particular scheme for safety of women under the nirbhaya fund one of the schemes namely one stop center scheme is implement is implemented one stop centers aim to facilitate women affected by violence with a range of integrated services such as police facilitation medical aid providing legal and psychosocial counseling and temporary shelter so this one stop centers actually provide a lot of benefits to women under one single roof itself the other uh, 
the next topic for the day is information technology intermediary guidelines and digital media ethics code rules 2021 intermediary guidelines and digital media ethics code these are two different uh, uh, subdivisions please note that down now why is it in the news the minister of state for information broadcasting informed the rajya sabha on thursday that the government will initiate action against those who write against the sovereignty of the nation under the digital media ethics code this is implemented by the ministry of information and broadcasting while this is implemented by the ministry of maiti ministry of electronics and information technology please remember that now what is the digital media ethics code we can we'll read about the entire thing actually instead of just reading about the digital media ethics code the center under section 87 clause 2 of the information technology act and in supersession of the earlier information technology guidelines rules had framed this particular rules now these particular rules mandate a grievance redressal system for over the top ott services and digital portals in the country this is necessary for the users of social media to raise their grievances against the misuse of social media to prevent social media from being misused the center has framed these particular guidelines and for any grievance redressal mechanism it has the center has given steps that have to be followed by these uh, social media entities now under the rules okay under the rules under the entire rules significant social media firms who are significant social media firms significant social media firms are those with more than 50 lakh registered users will be considered as significant social media intermediaries now uh, the, the examples that we can come up with are twitter facebook all these social media intermediaries which have definitely more than 50 lakh registered users so significant social media firms have to appoint a chief compliance officer a cco and have a nodal contact person who can be in touch with the law enforcement agencies 24 7 in case there is any problem in case there are posts which are anti-national or in case there are uh, posts which are demeaning a person which are uh, uh, which are uh, blackmailing a person uh, which talk about uh, cyber bullying all these posts need to be taken down and hence we need a chief compliance officer and a nodal contact person who has to be in touch with the loaded uh, with the law enforcement agency 24 by 7 a grievance redressal officer a social media platforms will also have to name a grievance redressal officer who shall register the grievance within 24 hours and dispose of it within 15 days please remember these particular details the case has to be registered within 24 hours and the case has to be disposed of within 15 days after it is registered with the grievance officer grievance redressal officer removal of content if there are complaints against the dignity of users particularly women about exposed private parts of individuals or nudity or impersonation etc social media platforms will be required to remove that within 24 hours after a complaint is made so as soon as there is a complaint that is made which is dealing with any of these issues that particular comp com uh, that particular post has to be removed within 24 hours also these significant social media firms need to publish a monthly report they will have to publish a monthly report about the number of complaints they have received and the status of the redressal we need a chief compliance officer we need a nodal contact person we need a grievance redressal officer we have to have removal of content and we need a monthly report which talks about all the things that have been done till now okay and then 
when it when we come to uh, digital media ethics till now most all of these things are related to social media however when we talk about digital content say uh, blogs say online news uh, content websites so when we talk about digital media so for that we have a separate digital media ethics code which is implemented by the ministry of information and broadcasting under that digital media ethics code there will be three levels of regulation for news publishers first level is at self regulation level the second level is at a self regulatory body which is headed by a retired judge and the third level is at the level of the information and broadcasting ministry including codes of practices and a grievance committee so so under these particular rules when it comes to uh when it comes to social media there are different rules and when it comes to digital media so social networking there are different rules and when it comes to digital media there are different rules like what we saw please go through these rules in detail there definitely be questions in the prelims there have been multiple questions asked from rules uh, over the last year and the last two years so please do read about these various rules that are there what happens in the case of non compliance when social media giants such as facebook twitter instagram and whatsapp messenger if they do not follow any of these particular rules they could face a ban that they will not be allowed uh, to operate within india they also run the risk of losing their status as intermediaries now what does intermediary mean often these particular social media giants they are actually given the status of intermediary under section 79 of the it act which means that if at all there is some particular criminal activity which is happening through these particular web uh, through these social media pages through facebook through whatsapp if there is criminal activity the criminal liability will not fall these particular social media giants rather only the person who is involved in that criminal activity is punished but however if these particular giants lose their intermediary status then you understand what's happening then these particular social media giants can also be prosecuted under the criminal acts that are committed under these uh, 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 applications like say for example someone is selling drugs on whatsapp now even whatsapp can be prosecuted for that particular criminal activity or say for example on facebook if there is uh, cyber bullying that's happening then facebook the facebook india md or someone can be prosecuted for that particular criminal activity so social media giants stand the chance of losing this particular protection that they have 